hail. We live in fear hail. So, hey, and welcome to Waters Garden Center. We're so glad that you tuned in. Uh, today's garden class here at Waters Garden Center. You folks online. We got a whole bunch of people here at the garden center. We wish you were here too. Uh, but our VIP members are especially special because you're virtual in person, which we really like. But we're glad that you tuned in as well. So we'll be here for you as you need it. Today's garden class is on vegetables and herbs. How do we plant those and get the most out of them? We're coming into our planting season now through May really is our peak planting season for all things edible. Not so much herbs. Herbs is a much uh, wider window, but everyone wants to plant tomatoes and peppers and watermelons. Uh, so we're going to go over that in detail. Again, you're seeing uh, what is going on here? Trying to get broadband up? Okay, sorry, we're trying to up your uh, your bandwidth here in just a minute. So we're trying to get more professional with the uh, online stuff. You're supposed to be digital and retail both. So we launched an online store. You can check out all the stuff that you see here. It's now uploaded to our online store. That is a big pain in the derriere. If you're a little company, to get all that stuff digitally connected and working. Digital is not fun, nor is it easy. So they make it look easy, like we got this free app, it'll make it all work for you. That is not true. So anyway, we're, we're getting better at it. We're getting better at the streaming thing for you all. So this actually uploads to our Facebook page, live streams. So if you, if you missed a class, you could tune in through our Facebook page. Also our YouTube channel, which uh, we just passed a million views. Uh, this this last few months so a million views for a little company in the middle of no place. We're not broadcasting to the world We're broadcasting to friends you all you're the ones looking at it and get getting the benefit of it. So uh, trying to get better at that
You folks out a little, little lower elevation, let's say Kirkland, Skull Valley, Camp Birdie, Cottonwood, a Dewey, Humboldt, uh, there you, you flirt pretty strong with zone eight. So you're a click warmer. So you can kind of cheat it and go, you can actually grow zone eights, probably get through with it pretty good. I grow some zone eight stuff, so some freaky palms, weird cacti, because I'm a gardener. I love, don't tell me I can't grow something up. We'll prove you wrong, right? Gardeners will prove you wrong. <laughs> so uh, I've got a few of these things, but there's some tricks. I'll pull them close to the house. I'll cover them up. I'll do some things to kind of cheat it. It doesn't take much to get you to the next zone. So you can kind of do that too. Uh, herbs. Most herbs, let's say like, we just we just harvested our first crop of very nice herbs. This is This is Italian oregano. Nothing like the smell. Fresh herbs from the garden. There's nothing like it. Store-bought's okay. Going to pick it from your, yourself out of your own garden, that's magic. This is actually a weed. It grows, it's perennial. It comes back year after year after year for years. This one plant will turn into this kind of size oregano. And so I really like to plant this in containers. Kind of confines it, keeps it kind of in check. Otherwise, this if you plant this in the middle of your vegetable garden, all you're going to have left in, in about two, three years is oregano. So I kind of, and it's very drought hardy, very tough. Uh, but fresh, fresh herbs. All of our herbs here at Waters Garden, all of our, actually all of our edibles, actually all of our plants, all of our plants are organic. But especially our herbs and vegetables, edible things. So we're very strong in not having chemicals put onto stuff. We don't put growth inhibitors on it like you'd find at a grocery store. They're, they're chemical free. So you can go through and just peruse and check and taste. And what's the difference between Greek oregano, spicy oregano, and Italian oregano? You can go just taste your taste your way through it. I would rather have you buy one of each myself because, you know, I own a garden center. So I'm selling plants for a living. But And I got a kid who's still getting through, through grad school. So you got to kind of... I need to sell a few more plants, keep the family going, but they're all here. Parsley, oregano, um, basil, rosemary, lavender all just came in. And they, they can all be planted right now, except for uh, basil's a little sensitive. Basil's kind of a crybaby. Just, if you look at it cold, it goes, I'm just, I'm done. I'll come back next year. Now nah, I'm just done. So basil's one of those, they're even more sensitive than tomatoes. So kind of wait on that one, cheat it down towards May, Mother's Day, and you're safer with that particular kind of, that specific herb. But most other herbs, what's another one? Cilantro can be a little funny that way. So it can be, maybe not come back before it gets cold. But everything else, they're gonna go, we just got lemongrass, so even, even the weird ones will come back for you. Tarragon, they'll come back for you. So they're perennial. So plant those where you're not going to be rototilling or turning the soil every spring or they'll, they'll be in the way that you get damaged. So you kind of want to be more strategic where, where do you put these perennial herbs or perennial vegetables like, where'd it go? Right here. Oh, my crew hates it when I go and show and tell. I bent the, the leaf. It'll grow another one. Um, this is um, artichokes actually grow here and they're perennial they'll come back year after year um, this that great big artichoke flower now i grow artichoke myself and and please never invite me over to dinner and serve artichokes i won't eat it i don't like it it's a gag thinking about it but i love the plant it's so pretty oh my gosh that flower coming out it looks prehistoric that huge i actually let it go to bloom it's got the most beautiful freaky like prehistoric flower that comes out that's really neat and it's got this great foliage to it it's just i use it as a structure designer plant but if you're from my like californians seem to love artichokes uh, you can grow them here and they're perennial so don't put them where you're going to be rototilling having to move them every year put them where they're going to be there permanently same with asparagus same with uh, strawberries uh, all your berries they're going to be perennial they're going to come back year after year so be strategic where you want things, okay? 
Dill is one I was most excited. It is so difficult to find dill. So we said, I can't find it in the open market. I'm going to grow it. I'm going to grow it ourselves. And so we just had our first crop of dill come in. Um, if this will be gone by the weekend. So if you're thinking dill, grab it now because it won't be here. It's like everyone is gardening. It's like this week, the entire town decide, decided we're, we're going to garden. And so dill is one of those harder to find things. Uh, so, oh my gosh. Perennial. Okay. Let's go to soil prep and how to plant. Uh, and we'll focus mainly on tomatoes, peppers, and squash, because they're the ones that are the problem childs. Uh, we have a problem here called blossom end rot. It's where the uh, a tomato grows up, where it fruits, and then it's, it pollinates, and then where that flower is touching, it'll actually have a rotten spot on the end. There's really only one thing that causes that, and it's a lack of calcium. We are sorely lacking of calcium in our soils. So you'll find this frequently that'll happen in your own gardens. But it's super easy to compensate, to get it ready, to, to, to make sure you don't have that. Uh, a couple tricks, and this, this affects tomatoes, very pronouncedly, peppers, very pronounced, and squash. My squash will start to, it'll form a little squash, I'll say zucchini or, or crooked X, and all of a sudden it'll get yellow and fall off blossom and rot. So what do you do? Calcium. So you're prepping your soil. And if you have not tried to dig a hole in your ground yet, realize our dirt is terrible. There's nothing but caliche rocks, granite. You're going to have to prep your soil. And so for me, I'm growing up in up above the high school here and I'm on a north facing slope. It's the hardest gardening I've ever done. For me, I just abandoned my, my soil. I just said, I can't, I can't garden this stuff. That's, I've given up. And so I created a whole bunch of raised beds on a slope. So I just put retaining block at the low end and backfilled with good stuff. Or I do a lot of gardening in pots. I mean, I've got over 50 containers of plants, kind of lots of patios. And we just, we just garden in them. It's just pretty. It looks garden-esque. And so um, that's a way of abandoning your ground. If you're gonna garden in your ground, what the book says is you should add two to three inch of organic matter every year. Organic could be manure, mulch, compost, uh, things that are composted. Two to three inch layer come and turn into one shovel's depth or one rototiller depth, about eight inches. Okay, the deeper, the better. Um, and that seems to work. Now, that solves your texture problems, that is, the soil wants to compact right back down to clay, where the roots have a hard time getting through. Uh, that'll change that. So now the roots, the soil will stay fluffier so the roots can go through it. You'll also want to add some nu nutrients. And so, tomato, uh, fruit, vegetable food, can, can they see that online for those folks? You can probably put a link or something. Uh, this is a food that we created because so many people are going with organic gardening for their fruit trees, their grapes, their berries, figs, and their vegetable gardens. And so here, it's, you'll notice it's 6447. Most fertilizers only have three numbers. But we wanted to let you know there's 7% calcium in this food, just because we know you're gonna struggle. We know there's gonna be a problem. We know that's gonna happen. So why not help you and put calcium in the fertilizer? So it's something we make for us. It's gonna work really well for us. And so you sprinkle some of this before I turn that into that one shovel step, I would, I would put this on and turn it into the ground at the same time. I like to save steps. Whenever you can combine steps, it makes gardening easier, I'm all in. And so I, I would do this. Another thing that I do, and this is kind of my garden. My name's Ken, okay, we're just friends. We're talking over the back fence and we're just, here's some things that worked in my backyard. I think it'll work in yours too. Uh, tomatoes are notorious for cracking or having really thick skins here. And the reason for that is that the, uh, it gets so hot, it goes from cool to really hot. And so as that plant dries out during the day, the fruit will actually swell, pulsates like this. So as it does that, it'll crack or the skin will get really tough going, I'm not gonna swell up with too much water 
in the morning and then evaporate, basically perspire during the day. So the more consistent you can keep the watering, the better. For me, I made this product called Aqua Boost. It's soil polymers. Polymers are, it's an agricultural product. This, this container of polymers will swell up and make like five gallons bucket of, of, of gelatin like, like polymers. Then we infuse them with mycorrhizal fungi. Fun, mycorrhizals are, it's beneficial to fungi that attach themselves to the roots of the plants. And it, it, it helps the plant actually root out deeper, longer, stronger, farther. So you expand the root mass. You get more roots and then keep the water around the root ball. It's a game changer for, 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 for cracking and, and having the fruits kind of be damaged. And so every time I plant a plant, I'll sprinkle a little bit of this in the bottom of the hole, kind of mix it in, and then I plant my plant over it. I want it to be where the roots are going through it. I'm encouraging deeper roots, and I want the moisture to stay right there around the root ball. So I'm planting tomato, squash, whatever it is. My big thing, my, my, my kryptonite, what I just, I can't, I, I have to do it. I love growing giant pumpkins. That's my thing. I love giant pumpkins. I'm not going to grow a thousand pounder. I don't even think you could do that up here. But if you can grow a pumpkin that's this big, your grandkids are going to go, whoa, that is so cool. We'll enjoy them. I'll pick them. I'll put them in a wheelbarrow, roll them to the front yard, show them off. Try to keep the javelina off of them because javelinas, they, they like pumpkins. Uh, and then we'll play hide and seek with the grandkids. And then here's the kicker. If you really want to, if you really want to like pizzazz them, we take them to the back deck and we drop them off and watch them go smash. They think that's the greatest thing ever. Kind of messy, but hey, you only live once with grandkids. They're still small. I think I think this generational thing with between parents, grandkids, grandparents, and grandkids, you can teach kids gardening. It's pretty easy. You just got to make it fun. So anyway, um, that's my thing. I do square foot gardening because I'm in raised beds. So I'm either in pots or I'm in defined beds. So maybe 10 by 12. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm planting more than you really should. I ignore the tag and I just want to, I put my tomatoes in cages so they grow up. So they don't take as much real estate. Otherwise they'll sprawl over from me to you. They'll be this big. I want them to stay up and I'll stake them from there. Uh, on the edges, I'll plant my squash, watermelons, giant pumpkins. So they're growing out over the edge of that pot. They're not taking up my main planting space. They're grow they're taking up over here. By the time the garden scene season's done, it almost looks like Jurassic Park. I mean, it's just like this. There are plants everywhere, just spilling out everywhere. But it's all about getting enough food up front, getting the texture of the soil right, lots of mulch. Or potting so if i'm doing it in containers i'm planting in straight potting soil i don't make up stuff never take stuff from your yard and put it into a pot it turns into a brick it just bakes and turns into brick you want to use your the reason you're, you're abandoning your soil out here so it's easier to garden and so water's potting soil that's our growers mix that's the same thing did i even bring a tomato here that's the same thing as it's this stuff. If you can give this plant more of this, what it already knows, it will just take off. You know, a very, very little transplant shot. And so I, I use a lot of potting soil in my plants. Bright light Swiss chard. This you can pick year round. I guess the reason I really brought this is um, I use this, I think we can think outside the box. So many times our grandparents conditioned us, tomatoes, squash, rhubarb, whatever it is, must march across the garden in, in straight lines and never vary. They must be like soldiers going through the landscape. I, I think outside the box, I put flowers with my vegetables. First of all, it does two things, makes it pretty. Second, it attracts the pollinators, it brings the bees. They can't, bees cannot resist blue or yellow. They, they just, they go, they love blue and yellow. You put a few blue petunias or yellow flowers in there. They are going to, they're going to come and help you pollinate your squash, which are hard to pollinate. You're going to help pollinate your, your, your pumpkins. They're hard to pollinate. You're going to come pollinate your, your watermelons. Those can be hard to pollinate. 
but a few flowers just makes it go. Um, I plant tomatoes in a pretty pot. I spray paint the cage that I have it growing in in some fancy color, reds, teals, whatever's trendy. I put it over my tomato and I put it right by the front door. When it's starting to fruit, people come by going, whoa, that's really cool. You can do that with a tomato? And yeah, and tomatoes are pretty. As long as you treat them like they're pretty. So they want to be pretty. They got ornamental fruits on them. They're just beautiful. So I think you, I've also uh, grown them on the front edge of my uh, container, raised beds, uh, especially in the front yard. I've got art up there, waterfall, water features. It's a patio. It's like a south, southwestern patio. And so I'll grow tomatoes up here and have it trail over. I don't cage them. Just have them trail over. And all of a sudden I've got my, my raised beds are so full of life, their tomatoes are bursting forth. That's what it looks like. So we can, you have permission, you have my permission to think outside the box and add Swiss chard. I frequently will add to my fall flowers, pansies, kales, um, uh, Dusty Miller. There's all these cool season plants that love to grow through the winter. Violas, Johnny Jump Ups. This is one of those with those bright red, bright yellow stems. They're pretty and they're edible. So use them as a as an ornament as well as a as a uh, edible where was i going soils foods uh put the food in once about eight inches depth uh tomatoes potatoes they benefit from even a little bit more depth so deeper is better minimum is eight inch what the book says you can go 12 14 that's even better they just just school of hard knocks it, it just works um okay now you're planting if you're doing square foot gardening, which is pretty common here because our space is limited, think in terms of up north and south. Put your big growing things to the north, tomatoes and cages, corn, great big plants back here. Put your shorter things towards the south. Otherwise, the tomatoes will shade all the things that are back here. And all of a sudden you're finding this, the north side of your gardens are not performing as well as the south side. So think in terms of crop rotations and then where to where to plant things so they're not they're not blocking each other out. Now you are allowed to plant a little bit more closer together. Come square foot gardening literally can happen. Another trick that happens with square foot gardening, you can plant a tomato like like uh, I brought this one. This is chocolate sprinkles tomato. It's a, it's a really dark red cherry tomato, and they're so delicious. Oh, my gosh. You cannot buy these at the grocery store. It's impossible. You can only grow them yourself. So we've got a whole series of plants that are, this is made to be planted either, you can either put this in the ground. So I, I take this home. Now, I own a garden center, remember. Um, I take this home. I take the bucket off, cut it off, and I plant it right in a big pot. And now, now I'm about three months ahead of you starting yours by seed. Now I do radio shows. I'm writing garden columns. As a gardener, there's something within us. You gardeners understand. There's bragging rights. You're at a you're at a party, backyard barbecue at Fourth of July. Going, oh yeah, I just picked my first tomatoes. They were so good. Oh, how are you doing on your tomatoes? There's some of this this uh, comparison stuff. So I don't plant every tomato this size. I plant a few just so I can tell you, yeah, I'm doing really well. How are you doing? Chocolate sprinkles. Um, on the back side, north side, because that thing's going to get this big. Bigger cage you can have, the better. You can't get a cage that's too big. You think this little tiny cage is so big when you put it first put it on the, on the tomato, all of a sudden by July 4th, it's like over, it's four feet above the cage. You're trying to figure out how to, how to stake it, keep it upright, which you can do, uh, but bigger's bigger's better. If you have a if you have a chance, bigger's better. Uh, someone was asking determinate and indeterminate tomatoes. We should cover that. We're going really deep now. This is like tomatoes 401. Okay, so mostly your grandparents grew indeterminate tomatoes. That is, there was no limit how big they would go. If we didn't have a frost, they would cover this entire greenhouse with, with tomato vine. It's huge. They get big, bigger than you and I. Indeterminate. is indeterminate how big they'll get. 
determinant are going to be shorter, defined. These are going to be like your patio tomatoes. Um, romas are determinant tomatoes. If you're doing tomatoes on a back patio or something, small spaces, you probably want to look at determinant tomatoes, not indeterminate that will take over. I mean, some determinate, indeterminate tomatoes, dogs, small children have been lost in tomatoes. They're just huge. They get big. And so you kind of want to figure out your space and where you want to go. That And I think you are allowed to prune tomatoes. You don't have to let all these suckers go off all over the place. You can go back and go, you are out of control. Nip them back. It doesn't seem to affect the, the fruit production. So if they get too just way too big, you can you can keep them back some. Um, another lesson I've learned: just hardest school of hard knocks. Everyone wants these great big slicing tomatoes. I do too. I want them. Doesn't mean I get them, but I want them still. Uh, in the mountains, because it gets so cool at night, the plants will actually stop growing. And then they'll wait till the next morning and they'll warm back up and then they keep growing. In Minnesota, that does not happen. It gets warm, they, the days are longer, and it, it just is, it's the same temperature all the time. They never shut down. They keep growing. Phoenix, they just keep growing. Up here, they stop growing. So what will happen is you'll put a, a beef steak or brandy wine or these anything with the word big beef in it uh, your pro, or steak probably stay away from those. And here's the reason why. If you're planting them at Mother's Day and they're shutting down at night every night, it'll be October and this plant will be huge. It'll be loaded with tomatoes this big and not one of you harvested. They're still green. They're still waiting and the first frost is starting to come. Remember, when's our first frost? Halloween, exactly right. So you could, you could cover them a little bit, but what I find is up here you'll get better production. It'll be less frustrating if you plant cherry tomatoes, sweet 100s, yellow pears, and smaller tomatoes. You'll be eating those, I mean, hundreds of them in very short order. Or go with medium-sized tomatoes, like Early Girl, Celebrity, Champion, San Diego. There's a whole bunch of them you can play with that are medium sized, because now you'll be harvesting those by the end of July, August. Now you're starting to pick some and be able to use them and enjoy them before frost comes. And it's all because our nights get so cool. That's the whole reason. So we're getting a late start and our nights are cool. If you're gonna go, I'm not gonna listen. I, I, I'm dealing with gardeners. Can't tell gardeners what to do or not to do. So if you're gonna do that though, what I would do is maybe cheat it and go, 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 with, go with a big one. This is like we're starting a greenhouse. Go big or go home. Or go big or watch the frost take them is what will happen. So if you're going to grow these big ones, start with a bigger plant just so you're weeks ahead of the season instead of instead of reacting to it. Just trust me, in October you'll be going, I wish I'd, I wish I'd listened to Ken. I went to that class over at Waters Garden Center and I didn't listen. And here we are. You can, you can pick them and harvest them, you know, ripen them in a box. For those, hang the, you take the vine, hang it upside down in the garage. There's all kinds of tricks you'll, you'll read about. It's just better just plant the right variety. You know the reason that grocery stores, the tomatoes taste so bad. They're not raised to taste good. They're raised for shipping a thousand miles, not bruising. They're raised so they have 10, 10 days shelf life in the grocery store. They're not raised for flavor. They're raised for agriculture making bucks square more bushels per square acre there's a whole kinds of reasons but not for flavor you have to raise them in your backyard for flavor now you can pick the preferred varieties old-fashioned varieties heirloom varieties and grow them and they can be quite successful okay it's the only way to truly get flavor and that's why that's the insiders that's the real reason okay let's go over blossom set so we're notorious for peppers not setting a fruit until July. They've been planted for two months. They're still sitting there looking at me. They're growing, but not setting a fruit. It's quite frustrating. A lot of that has to do with the nighttime temperatures. Can be a little bit too pollinators, but really it's nighttime temperatures. Uh, or you front loaded 
your 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 soil is so heavy with with manure, so it's got all this nitrogen, and this plant is just going. I'm just going to focus on growing because nitrogen. Remember nitrogen, phosphorus, potash, nitrogen, manure. It's what forms green growth, foliage, lots of lots of lots of real growth. Phosphorus, that's the one that forms fruits, roots and fruits. You want roots and fruits? You want more carrots? Phosphorus. You want more fruits? Phosphorus. That middle number. Potash. Really, we have quite a bit of potash in our soil already. That's going to be like volcanic ash, that kind of stuff. So that's going to form uh, disease resistance. The thick of the leaf, the thickness of the leaf, the stem stem thickness, more robustness. That's what that last number is for. You really should not be adding in your own gardens wood ash, barbecue ash. Don't. That's an East Coast thing. Don't don't read those articles. Don't take that ash and throw it out in your yard. It kills the soil. Trust me. Now we have so much ash already in our water, in our soil. It's everywhere. That's the reason our soil pH is so high, because Granite Mountain, uh, not Granite Mountain, uh, Thumb Butte, Glassford Hill, all the ridge lines around it, they used to be all old, old, old volcanoes. And so all that ash that was, all the cone that was around that core has settled down. And now we are gardening volcanic ash, basically. Or at least our water, we dig a hole, poke a hole in, call it a well or a straw. Now it's sucking all that water up through that volcanic ash. It just makes the water really alkaline. Now you add more ash, you can kill your soil. I've done it. School of hard knocks. I don't want this for my friends. Don't do that. Just throw it in the trash, get it away. Or what I used to do is pour it on the fence line, pour it where you don't want things to grow. It's a great soil sterilizer. So pour it on the fence line, the driveway, that kind of place. Don't put it in your gardens. Trust me. Okay. Um, now, if you got, if this plant is growing like crazy, what I will do is I take two things home with me whenever I plant my gardens. There are two bottles. I'll take one of each. Trust me, this is going to work. One is blossom tomato and pepper blossom set. The other one is yield booster. And once a week, I go and spritz. My, my plants. Makes me feel good. Makes them really happy. Blossom set, once that plant is up to size, about this big, I'll start plant, I'll start spritzing the foliage with blossom set. This will force the plant to start setting fruit. Here's the misunderstanding. How are we doing on time? Because I go off. I can go deep. I can go as deep as you want on all the chemicals, all the chemistry, what the plant's doing. This is plant botany, probably at a, at a higher level. What plants do is they, they get to growing so quick, so fast. Literally, a tomato will forget to stop growing and set fruit. So this is not pollen. You're not spritzing the flowers. You're spritzing the foliage. What it does, it causes the plant to slow down for a couple days, take a breather, and go, oh, yeah, I should set some blossoms. It just That's literally what it's doing. And so you want to focus on... You'll, you'll see it like Walmart, except they got an eight ounce bottle of this stuff. And that's, there's no way that's enough for a season for even one dose. You want the big, if I could get this in a gallon, I would sell it. So you want the biggest bottle you can get, you're spraying the foliage of your cucumbers, peppers, tomatoes, just about everything. It'll help it set more fruit. So blossom set, tomato, pepper, set, blossom set. That's one thing. I'll start this probably middle of May, somewhere in there is when the, the gardens are, are big enough to start doing that. You, the plants are up large enough, you can start, start forcing them to set some flowers and some fruit. The other weeks, where'd it go? I spray with, where did it go? Right there. With yield booster. Yield booster, this is liquid calcium. Again, such a problem with blossom end rot here. So you're going to struggle with that side. And so this is, I've front loaded my soils with some calcium. Uh, my, my fertilizer I'm using has calcium, 7%. But then I'm gonna spritz the foliage again. I spritz the, the foliage as it grows with this. This is in a liquid form where the plant can actually absorb it through the foliage and take it into the structure of the plant. So now I don't need the soil at all. I, I've got calcium right there on the plant as we go. And I, I don't have blossom in ground. There's no, there's no, it's frustrating. Your first tomato is this big half of it is rotten. That's not right. 
So this kind of solves that. It also brings a flavor out. Again, wasp calcium increases the size and the flavor gets sweeter with calcium. So those are two little tricks that I'll share with you. Blossom set, yield booster. And I will run out of both of these, guaranteed, before the season ends. So as, as the gardeners start coming in, everyone starts getting these two things. So my friends, grab them early, grab them often, grab them what you need for the season, grab them now, because literally by the second week of May, I won't have any. Or at least that's the way it was last year. And this year is trending faster, better, bigger than last year. So just gardening is freakishly popular right now. I've never seen anything like it. Um, four containers. This could be not just for vegetables. It could be for flowers. If you just have container gardens, um, I created a, a special fertilizer just for that. It's called Flower Power. This is a water soluble. For the love of gardening, can I sip on my soapbox for just a moment? Um, Take the miracle Grow box that's in the garden shed, go over to the dumpster, and just throw it away. Please, for the love of garden, get rid of that garbage. It does not grow tomatoes the size of your head. That's all marketing. It doesn't really do that. It actually, in, in our with our water, you put miracle Grow. they'll probably give me a cease and desist online. Sorry about that. But anyway, miracle Grow with our water, it's a salt-based fertilizer. It will, it'll, it'll keep the plants from rooting. You'll get this heavy, caked up white mass at the bottom of the pot. It just does, it's just too heavy in minerals. It's, it's bad for your plants. I stopped selling that 10, 15 years ago. And that's the easiest product in the world. Stack it high, watch it fly. That's retail because the marketing's already done. Just put on an end cap, every cart will have one. But if your customers keep coming back and saying, I have problems, the plants are yellowing, they aren't fruiting, and it always comes back to Miracle Grow. I consciously can't I can't sell that. No amount of money is worth that. And so now what are we going to do? We made our own fertilizer. It's 48% phosphorus. That's remember, nitrogen phosphorus product. That middle number is fruits and flowers. 48% uh, as high as we could go and still keep the phosphorus water, keep it from coagulating and settling to the bottom. So it's it's available right now to the plant. So you could do this a couple times a month. Every other week or so, it's got a little scoop in there, add it to your water, water your containers in. You're going to have tomatoes the size of your head. Not really. Don't go with those big tomatoes. Go with medium-sized tomatoes. Uh, but it will grow nicer pumpkins, nicer. It'll grow nicer fruits and really nicer flowers. Those hanging baskets, we're famous for hanging, hanging baskets. Do this a couple times every month. You will have very nice, pretty, covered, covered in flowers, hanging baskets. Really, it, it'll do I could dip this hat in flower power right now. It would start to bloom. Maybe not, you know. Anyway, but it does actually work. Okay, so got our calendar dates. And this is coming to you. That garden calendar is coming. How to grow tomatoes. It's coming your way. One sheet. Um, soil prep, we got that. I think you could plant now. Here's what Prescott's famous for. So it's it's we're a month before Mother's Day, three weeks. Okay, the funny thing about it's a hundred years of data, hundred years, the average lands on May eighth specifically for Prescott, Arizona, May tenth for Prescott Valley, Chino Valley, we're all sort of the same. Okay, May eighth, so half of those years, it was frosting. I've seen I've seen it snow on Memorial Day, so the middle of May it was still frosting, or it could be the middle of April, still and it's no more frost, but the average comes in at about Mother's Day is a holiday that we use to watch it. So you, I, it looks like the 10 days looks really good. Looks like we could start. What I do, I'll commit a little bit now to my gardens, but I don't go all the way in. Now I wanna sell shopping cart loads of, of vegetables. But to my friends, I would suggest plant a few and then commit some, maybe maybe every week, add a few, so that if frost does come, we're notorious for that one last frost, and it takes out your basil and your tomatoes. But if you aren't all in, you just lost one or two, it's not as, it doesn't hurt you as bad. So, but when it takes the whole garden, it, it's really painful, really, really painful. Um, so that's some things that can maybe help you, or just be ready to cover the garden with a sheet, burlap, Wilts, just cover it, keep that frost off the plant, 
is if we get cold now, it'll be a flash frost. So it'll be one night, then it's back warm again, just like that. So do its damage, it'll be back to back to nice. So be ready if you're planting now, just to cover things if you need to. Take take a box, anything. Do not use plastic. Plastic does harm. But what it does, it holds the cold in around the plant. It does more damage than good. If you want a breathable material like frost cover. We sell frost covers. It's a lightweight fabric. Doesn't crush your plant. It's white. Keeps a frost up here. Doesn't allow it to go around the plant, but it breathes. So just be ready to have something for you. Okay. What else did I get here? We should cover bugs. Let me take a sip of soda here. I've been talking all day. and you're, I've got allergies. My junipers are going crazy. You can feel your, your throat kind of going, ah, I can feel the scratchy throat. How many have had their vaccine shot? Oh, wait. Just about every while. Me too. The whole crew's had it. So, well done. It does give you a sense of confidence. I mean, just with your with your colleagues you work with, it helps you come to work and not worry about if, if you're, you know, the high school kid down there is going to kill you with COVID or something. It just helps you. There's, it just is a relief. So, yeah. I know. I already saw you raise your hand. I know you got your vaccine. You don't have to. That's okay. You put it down now. <laughs> yeah, water. That's a good one. Okay, so they, she asked. Uh, we're not ignoring you. We know you're there. Uh, when and how do you water? Let's just cover that. It's best to water, especially edibles, before the heat of the day. Plants are just like people. You don't go out and run a mile, you know, up, uphill in the heat of the day without hydrating before you before you do that. And you should really hydrate your plants before the heat, before that 10, 11 o'clock hour. Make them plump. Uh, it'll make them better to pick. They'll be juicier than they pick to pick. So really, you should be watering before 8 o'clock in the morning. Truly. So I'll water 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 o'clock in the morning. So the earlier, the better. Um, never, ever, ever water at night. Don't do that to yourself. Because I'm going to make a ton of money off of you from wheat leaf curl and, and, and powdery mildew and leaf spot, all these different, basically plants get athlete's foot in the foliage if, if they stay real wet during the evening. And so especially tomatoes, tomatoes want to die. They're looking, just give me a reason to die, I'll do it for you. So, so the, and the number one way is they get wet and they stay wet in the, in the evening. And so if you're watering in the morning, it allows them to get plumped up, juiced up, and then they're able to dry out. I would say no, water no later than maybe 3 o'clock in the afternoon um, is better. Make sure they're dry going into That's a myth that Phoenix, that's a curse Phoenix gives us. There they go. You should water at night. It's better. It's more efficient. Yeah, when it's 110 out at midnight, who would live? That's why we don't live down there. That's crazy, man. Who lives 10 miles from the sun? That's crazy. So come up to God's country. Get out of that. But don't water at night here. Just trust me. In the morning, deep soak. Uh, another mistake many people make, they're watering frequently, really light, especially with drip irrigation. I'll water 10 minutes every day. Uh, 10 minutes with one gallon emitter at the base of your artichoke. So it runs for an hour, you get one gallon. How much is that? It's, you spit on it, basically. So you're creating very shallow, you water, the water penetrated about that far you really want to water the entire root zone plus a little more. That's going to create a really deep rooted drought hardy. Even when it's June, it's 10% humidity. Um, it's just rough. It's hundred degrees, 10% and there's a wind. That's not nice to plants have a lot of new foliage. So water early in the morning, you get better off in a deep soak in. Also another thing I find many of my plants look really rough in June. Just get them through June. They don't have to look pretty. They just have to live because the monsoons almost always, every time I've ever known, except last year, comes in July. And now the humidity goes up. There's a cloud cover. We get some afternoon rains, and it's a game changer for, for, for your edibles, your vegetables, your herbs. They will, set, they will just quadruple in size because the soil's warm, the humidity's there. You might have to fertilize them again about then. Because you've used up all the food, because you've watered so much to get them through June, um, you might need to fertilize a little bit. Let's give them the, the, the fruit and vegetable food. 
It'll really make a difference. Uh, bugs. Did I cover that for you okay? Watering? I think, I think we got it. Bugs. Bugs are a problem. Bugs like to eat things like you do. Animals like to eat things. They like to eat tomatoes. Havelina love tomatoes. Squash bugs. Guess what they love? Squash. Cucumber bugs. Guess what they love? Cucumbers. Uh, for me, I get mildew on my, every year's mildew. I know I'm going to get mildew in August on my pumpkins and squash. It's just powdery. It's a powdery coated, coats of leaves, and it literally sucks the life out of the leaves. They'll turn yellow, drop, and it can kill the plant. This is my first line defense of all bugs. It's called triple action. It's an organic, so you can spray this up to the day of harvest. And it's still organic, still safe. I'd still wash the food and stuff and some common sense. Uh, but it's, it's probably the safest organic um, insect control we have. And the beautiful thing is this also controls mildew. So I, I just know I'm going to get mildew on my pumpkins and squash. So I'll spritz this over the foliage. as After my first couple of rains, I'll go ahead and spray this. And it's, it's got a repelling action to it. So it'll it basically it locks that spore and doesn't let it spread. So it's really quite quite useful. It does not work on grasshoppers. The big well, I guess it does. If you do this, you can hit them over the head with it. But the spray itself doesn't actually work on big bugs. It really works really well on flea beetles, ciliads, woolly aphids, it trip, all those things that, that hit the early 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 uh, gardens. Works really really well. Anyway, that's bugs. You know, some trivia, if you just want to know what's, what COVID has done to the to the ag industry. So neem oil, the freaky thing, this is, a, this is from India. That's where they harvest neem oil, from neem trees. There are no neem farms. It's little guys from New Delhi go out, you know, and they go, go in the middle of the courtyard streets and they harvest neem oil from these trees. And uh, COVID interrupted the harvest last year. So that's what they're using for this year's triple action. So all the organic gardeners is just up in arms going, there's not enough, there's, and there isn't enough. Except at Waters Garden Center, I, I just grabbed everything I could find. I got 20 cases just laid in of this stuff because it's so popular and there's going to be a shortage. So the hiccups we see is so weird that you'd never see coming any other year. So it's all COVID related. Okay. Yes, in the back. So for this, yeah, so our question was, um, it, does this come in concentrate? Can you put it in a hose and spray or just hose down the planet or a tree, fruit trees? This will work really well on, on coddling mold. Uh, yes, we've got to concentrate. Yeah, it's just, it's just heavier, bigger. This shows off prettier. Look, everyone needs one. Then, then a concentrate, it's just harder to use. But it does actually quite a, quite a very effective. Yeah, what else? Questions? Yeah. Good question. So she's asking, she has a lot of container gardening. I'm sure I got this right. Does potting soil get old? Yes. All soil gets old. Or the plants use it up. In fact, you'll actually notice potting soil or a raised bed, you'll see the you'll see the soil just disappear. It's not the wind. The plants are using the soil up. And so I tried, I've got some really big pots. I try to add some freshness into my containers every year. For my little pots, you know, smaller than this, I replace all the soil. Go new. Because it's all roots. It's just, it's just matted with stuff. You can see all the new growth from last year. In my big pots, that's not very practical. So what I'll do is I'll take out that top layer where all the roots are, you, know, you can kind of tell where the plants were going. I'll try to take that out, and then I'll, I'll add that to my raised beds or someplace over here, and I'll put some fresh potting soil, and I find that I, I get a better, my plants take better. If you're doing raised beds, I'll try to add some potting soil in that top layer and not blend it in. I'll know, I won't mix it. Just a layer where I can take this plant, and it goes right into water's potting soil, because I want this thing to know, it doesn't, all it knows is water's potting soil. It knows our growers mix. So if I can put it in more soil just like that, it'll just take off a new growth, just like that. So I try not to blend it in. 
yeah, that, that's it. Let me take hers because she was waiting so patiently. Then I'll come. We'll cover you. We'll cover humic. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. good. Question. So, the question was: Are fabric containers effective? Highly effective. Yes. They can dry out a little bit faster because they're more exposed. The great thing is, that if you can keep them watered. That's where I would really use the Sockle Boost. It would really help. Uh, they just dry out a little bit faster. They will grow roots really well. because you got they, Plants need air at the root level. Uh, if you fill up all those air pockets with water molecules, they'll drown just like that. Within short order, like a week, they're dead. So you want they want to be able to breathe. Um, literally, I've seen a toilet bowl in a front yard with flowers growing out of it. You can grow in anything. It's don't I don't encourage that. It's not classy. It's very redneck, just so you know. Uh, but if your cars are up on blocks and you're living in a whatever, uh, it's okay, but don't do that. As long as you got drainage, you're good. So you need a hole of some sort. If you if you have a any kind of, of container that has no drainage, there's no way to throttle back your watering. Not, and not fill up that pot by the end of the season with water. You punch it through holes in it, you're good. Uh, the other myth people see, um, oh, metals get too hot, or dark colors get too hot. It's like the color of the material makes a difference, makes no difference. I've got oxblood red pots, I've got blue pots, I've got black pots, I've got white pots. They all grow the same, as long as they have drainage. Because as soon as you start watering, that, that soil is going to fill up with, with uh, water. It's going to cool all whatever that material is. So I don't think it's as, as important. I would say watch mainly um, what is the material made out of. You know, sometimes you get galvanized, new galvanized pots. That stuff they galvanize with, that can translocate in plants. Treated timbers, they're treating those so they don't rot. Sometimes that can translocate into your plants. So kind of watch that if you're eating it. If it's flowers, you know, who cares? I guess you do have to care with hummingbirds, that kind of stuff, but it's less less of an issue. Uh, but I try to consciously think through, I'm trying to, I'm an organic gardener, and I don't want a whole bunch of chemicals in my, moving into my soils kind of stuff. And you can control all that stuff. Okay, railroad ties, watch that one. That's a lot of creosote. It's nasty stuff that they make those, those railroad ties not rot last 100 years. So kind of I wouldn't use those for my vegetable garden. And they, they scream 1980s. So they just eat your house like crazy. So right now it's raised bed. I have a uh, retaining block is what I use. It's kind of, it's a trendy thing today. Tomorrow it'll be something else. So anyway, I can drive down a neighborhood. I could date your house just by your landscape. Just, yep, 80s, 90s, 2000s. Yeah, got it. Yep, yep, yep. You can date a house just by what's out front. That's why you need to replace. You need, I suggest 10% new stuff in your landscapes every year. That big old overgrown juniper, it deserves a chainsaw. It does not deserve to live. It's, it's dating you. Add a fresh, something new. So, so if I have a death, I'm okay with that. But I own a garden center. But I think it does date. Sometimes our houses get too dated or too overgrown. And just adding a little bit of freshness in there. And that's what they teach you. That's why McDonald's. Go through the drive through they got fresh new plants. They know you'll feel better, cleaner, fresher when you get your Big Mac if the landscape looks fresher and newer. So our landscape out front, we purposely replace the trees every 10 years. We chainsaw them down. I don't want a glorious, beautiful maple out there. I want a fresh, vibrant, new one out there. They're more inspiring. So just that's a, that's a landscape technique. They don't tell you that. But that, that does actually work in architecture and design, that kind of stuff. Has nothing to do with vegetable or herb gardening, but it does help you have a nicer landscape. Okay, what else? I'll take one more question. And then we're exactly one hour in, which is where I wanted to be. Oh, Cumec. Sorry, yes, Cumec. Cumec is great. So we've got a product down there called Humic, H-U-M-I-C. It's humic acid. If you're doing seed crops, um, uh, carrots, radishes, that kind of, starting beans, peas, it is great stuff. Uh, what it does, it feeds the soil. 
So the plants want, so the worms want to want to work in that soil. So mycorrhizal colonies want to take over kind of all the new stuff that, that makes the soil alive, brings the soil alive. It feeds the soil. When you put a plant in a soil that's alive, it kind of goes, oh my gosh, something's going on here. This this has got to, this is rocking. I should, I should just grow here. So these just, they, they root out faster. It doesn't feed the plant. It feeds the soil that feeds the plants. So it's just the opposite. We're really going deep into organics. That's how humic works. Works really great for lawns, works great for new gardens where you want new little plants to grow fast. Humic is a good additive. It also does another thing. It lowers the pH, makes it more acidic. So if your plants go yellow on you, it's because you've watered so much, and the water's really alkaline, the water, all of a sudden, the pH started creeping up, and you'll get some yellow leaves. And you'll come in for iron. I'll sell a ton of iron in July and August. It's not iron. It's the pH. You want to lower the pH. So the irons that we sell here at the garden center, we've got some that are, it says fast acting iron, but really what it is, is iron sulfate. We're actually helping you lower your pH. It makes it green like fast. We look like rocks. We look like super horticultural heroes. It's because we're picking a product. We're helping you pick a product that we know you need. It has it has the word iron in it. You don't need iron. You need sulfur. So we combine the two, and it makes everything kind of click. So watch that. If you start to yellow, come talk to us. Since the pH has gone up too high, and it's super easy to correct. Do not ever, and I'll leave it with this. Do not add lime. To your gardens. This is an East Coast, Chicago, they call it the Great Garden Arc from DC to Boston to, to Chicago, Minnesota to, to Seattle. That's where all the gardening is really done in the country. They make products for that. That's where all humanity lives. They're not making garden products for the few people that live here in the Southwest. Uh, so, lime, they'll tell you the lime sweetens the soil. What it does, it raises the pH because everywhere else in the country, they have very they have acid problems. It's really acidic. They want to raise that pH and make it more neutral. Our water is already over the top. In fact, you I don't even know if it's worth trying to lower your pH to 6.5, which is the perfect pH. If you get it down below 7.2, 7, good enough. That's really good. I've seen it creep up as high as 9.2, 9.4 which is if you, had, if you had a hot tub or pool, that's like you get in a hot tub with 9.0 pH, you get out, your skin wants to crawl off. In plants, their roots want to crawl off. So it's not good for it. So I said that was the last question. I already cheated it over. So, okay, thank you. Good, I'll give you your $20 bill later. Yeah, it's good, good paid, paid advertisement. So she asked if strawberries are over here, can we plant strawberries now? My strawberries are growing. They're setting fruits right now in my own gardens. This is an established, well-established bed. So yes, it's a great perennial edible plant that can be right out there in the yard. In fact, I, I use them kind of as a ground cover. Uh, and if I get some fruits, great, but they're just pretty. So yes, you can absolutely plant strawberries right now. And frost, not gonna hurt them. I mean, snow, not gonna hurt them. They'll be right out there and grow. So it's a great one to have. Great. We're in good strawberry country. With that, I'll hang out as long as you want. I'll put my mask on. I'll just You can come look at the plants if you want. Um, this back greenhouse, there's lots of vegetables just off the truck, lots of herbs. This will be our entire herb section. Berries and, and, and base berries. And then vegetables will be in the back. All of them are non-GMO, organic, ready to plant when you're ready. I'll let you clap. Thank you. Appreciate it, you all. Good class. Good energetic class. All right. Most of this will be in that handout when it, when it comes your way, too. So, absolutely. Rearrange them, however, makes the picture best. Yeah, they will be. I sure will be. Hey, you're welcome. Wine Take barrels. a picture. We're at wine barrels are great. You can grow up to, you can go uh, two tomatoes.